Thank you, Nate. I appreciate that introduction. And thank you all for attending. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as Nate said, we're going to talk about what we need to do to basically get our programs in order. And the, whoa, I inherited a mess, basically came out of my personal experience from being a program director and what I actually walked into. So again, what we're going to cover today is how to transform your staff, recover from poor record keeping, and how to properly track our students in the classroom as well as in the field. So those are the things we're gonna cover. And now we have a polling question for you. And that is, have you ever participated in a co-amp site visit as a program director? So if you guys could please answer the question. And I will wait for your feedback before we continue. Okay, great. So thank you for that. Quite a few of you have not, the vast majority, actually 73%, have not participated in a co-amp site visit as a program director. So that's very good. So guys, please feel free to ask me any questions, send the questions, and Nate will definitely let me know. And we will address your questions as they come up. And we'll also have time for Q&A at the end of the session. So, and I will try to provide a little bit more detail since there are quite a few that have not served as program director. So as program directors, when we first start our programs, we are all excited and ready to go and it's day one and we're just trying to get a feel of it. We're trying to figure out where everything is and week one, we're still excited and we're happy and we're ready to basically get in the groove and learn where everything is. And so day one, week one, month one, we're still happy and ready to go. And as we research and find information or as we are unable to find information, that's when we start to realize that we actually may have a problem on our hands. So what do we do with that? So first thing we have to do is we have to take to the time to identify our needs. What do we have? We have to get organized. Identify our haves and our needs. Do we have adequate staffing? Do we have enough equipment? Do we have enough supplies? What do we have and what do we need? And then we have to establish our priorities. And when I say our priorities, do we have a co-amp site visit coming? Do we have paperwork that's due to the state. Did we start at the beginning of the program, in the middle of a program, or did we come in at the tail end of the program? So where are we in the program? What's required? When is it required? And what do we need to do to get there? So we have to establish our priority. What are our due dates? So those are the things we have to identify. Do we have a self-study report that's due? Is this our program's first time becoming accredited or are we up for recertification? So those are the type questions that we have to ask ourselves. And for those of you that work for a technical college, what about your regional accreditation? So all of those things are things we have to consider and identify and we have to establish our priorities and understand what we have as well as what we need. So the first thing we have to do is set goals. Set goals. What do we do? Do we have a self-study report due? Establish our goals. When's our next class started? What's our next major deliverable? And once we identify that, we set those goals, we establish a timeline. Do we have three months to get it done? Do we have two weeks to get it done? When is this information due to the state, to co-amps, to National Registry? to the regional accrediting body, when is it due? So we have to establish the timelines and we have to track our progress. And there are several different ways we can track our progress. 
For instance, for me, when I took over my last program, I had three months to do three years worth of work because what should have been done wasn't done. Of course, I didn't know that at the time when I was hired. However, once I got in, I didn't have much of a choice but to get it done so that we could get accredited. So your timelines, you may have an ample amount of time where you may have to do a lot of work in a hurry, which definitely adds stress to our lives. So track your progress. How do you track your progress? I personally like Microsoft Project. And it's a tracking tool and you can put your task in, you put the due date, and you can also measure your progress as you go through. One of the things I did when I received my response back from our self-study report, I went to Kinko's, I printed out posters, and I posted them on the wall behind my desk. And I used my marker to mark off as I went along what was due, when it was due as I was making progress, I would cross it off or put a slash through it and put 50%. So there are several different ways you can track your progress. If you work for a university system, technical college, you can go to your graphics department and have them print it out. Your recommendations that you receive back from COANTS and track your progress like that. Use a calendar. There's an app for almost everything now. So use a to-do list app. There are a number of different ways you can track your progress, but the most important thing is to get organized because when you get organized, it's gonna save you a tremendous amount of time. This is an example of Microsoft Projects. And as you can see, 70% complete, 30% complete, 100% complete. And you just track your progress as you go along. For me, it helps me to stay organized as well as stay focused. And it helps me to keep my priorities in order. And having your priorities in order is going to be huge as you get into the thick of doing the many tasks you have to do filling in for instructors. And some of you, even though you're a program director, you may also be the instructor. So you have to fill in. You have to schedule clinicals for the students. You have to do all the administrative paperwork. You have to schedule advisory board meetings. There's a ton of things you have to do in that you need to do as a part of your job. So staying organized will help you tremendously. What's on the screen now is another tracking tool, which for me, it's a bit too busy. However, it is an option. I do like the colors. However, it's too much. So I would minimize and only look at one or two at a time, one or two charts or graphs at a time. And my purpose of showing you this is to show you that there are many different options and you can choose which method works best for you, but definitely choose a method to help you get organized and to stay focused. Hey, Carlene, can I interrupt you for a question real fast? Absolutely. Um, so when would you consider maybe needing to use something like this? Like, what would you consider in a hurry? How, ball, could you ballpark maybe how much time it takes to develop and submit to co -Ames? Okay. So the co process is, it actually takes place over a few years. And so you submit your, your self-study reports, gathering that information. If your records are in order, you can put it together in a matter of days because what you're doing is you're getting records from previous classes. You're getting your notes from advisory board meetings or your consortium meetings. You are getting records from graduates and feedback from the graduates to, to do your SWOT analysis. And so you should have all the information on hand. So the problem comes is when you don't have those records and when you don't have things in order. And like I mentioned before, I had three months to do three years worth of work because it wasn't done. So realistically, if you have if records, everything being equal, you don't have to rush to get things done if you are maintaining your records and keeping track.
The problem is, is if you come into a program and the records haven't been kept, then you have to find out what's the next due date from COAMS. So do you have a site visit coming? Do you have a self-study report due? Do you have citations or progress report that's due? And with those things, COAMPS will give you a date. They'll actually give you the date. This is when this is due. Or you can expect this to be due in four to six weeks. Or we'll contact you again in six to eight weeks. So they'll give you the timeline as to when things are due. But overall, you have the whole process takes a couple years to from start to finish before you have your site visit. So as a new program director, what I would recommend is to find out where you are in the process. And if you don't have those records or there's no one on your staff that knows, contact COAMS or COA and they'll give you that information. You will need to know your program number, but when you contact them, they'll let you know what's next for you and when your program is up for review or where you are in the initial phase of your initial accreditation. Awesome, thank you so much. Very good. So again, guys, get organized on the front end and it will save you days, if not weeks worth of work and headaches and frustration trying to figure out what's going on and what I need to do. The question was asked about co-amps and I will say this, if you have the opportunity to go to a co-amps workshop, take advantage of it. Go to a workshop, go to more than one workshop. I've gone to several. If you can go to a credit con, go to a credit con. And the reason I recommend going to more than one workshop is because at each workshop, you learn something different. You get different nuggets out of it. And you're also building relationships with the um, co amps personnel, as well as uh, your, co your cohorts, your colleagues, other people that are in the same situation that you're in. So it's a great networking opportunity to go and meet people and interact and build that network so that when you have an issue, you have someone to reach out to. You have someone that you can call to help you solve the problem. Or when you say, hey, I can't find any minutes for the advisory board meetings. What do I do? And they can walk you through that process. And we will talk about what to do in those situations a little bit later. So now that you're organized and you know what you have, you know what documentation you have, you know what reports you have, you know what's missing, you can set a timeline in a way to rectify those problems. And we're going to talk about poor record keeping and how to recover from that in just a little bit. So now we're going to talk about your staff and you're organized. Now you can begin to focus on your staff and changing the culture of your program and you've identified what you need, but now you need to identify what your staff needs are, but also get to know your staff. Were you hired internally? Were you promoted internally or were you hired from the outside? And that's going to make a difference as to how your staff reacts to you. So when you came in, your personnel, are your employees, are they disgruntled? Are they burnt out? Are they jealous because you got the position and they didn't? Are they overwhelmed because they've been doing everything for so long and they're just tired? Are they withholding information from you? Are they helpful? Are they sharing information? Are they ready to work with you? So you have to figure those things out so you will know what's their personality, what's their mentality, what's their emotional state, who am I dealing with? So that's important because that's gonna help you know how to approach them and how to get buy-in from them. So once you identify, who am I working with? What are they like? What are their needs? So then you ask yourself, well, what's their favorite, or ask yourself, you ask them, what's your favorite subject? What do you prefer teaching? What's your skill in the lab that you enjoy the most? What's your least favorite topic to, to lecture on? And you capitalize on their strengths and you provide professional development 
for the areas they're not as comfortable with. And I don't necessarily want to call them weaknesses because just because they don't care to do it, it doesn't mean that they are incapable of doing it. So we still want to, to help develop them to make them more comfortable. So if they do not care to teach asset based, then we can do some professional development on that. If their issue is technology and with what's going on in the world today, we're doing a lot more hybrid training. Like now, instead of us all being together at a conference, we're doing it virtually. So does your staff need help with technical issues? So, or understanding technology, learning technology, learning how to do a Zoom or a webinar or to even interact with students virtually. So all those things are things that you can consider and professional development is a requirement of COA. So, and I say COA or co-amps, it's all the same thing. So it's a requirement, professional development, and you have to show proof that you have done professional development with your staff. So this is an opportunity for you to help strengthen your employees as well as satisfy requirements for accreditation. So all of those things are things that you need to consider. And now that you understand that, and by you interacting with your staff and asking them for their strengths and what's their least favorite topic to lecture on, you are building a relationship with them. And it's also helping you with your scheduling and with your planning. And if you're short staffed, and guess what? They don't have a choice, but by you taking that extra step to help them will help build that loyalty and build that trust and build that mutual respect that you need to get your job done because the better they are and the better they do their job, the better you can do your job. So it's all in the end going to benefit you. It's going to benefit your staff and as well as going to benefit the students and ultimately the communities that we serve. So once you understand your staff and you understand their personalities and their mentality and you understand their strengths and the areas they need to improve upon, then you can begin your transformation process. So you can take them from the caterpillar to the beautiful butterfly and because you know what you're working with. And that is going to help you determine your approach. So once you've identified that and you're ready to transition your program, then what do you have to do? You have to get buy-in from them. How do you get buy-in? There are several different ways you can get buy-in from your staff. And you get buy-in by engaging them. So for instance, effective domain, that is something new that we now have to fairly new that we are now required to track and evaluate our students on. Some call it effective domain. When I first started, we called it work ethics. And do you show to work? Do you show up to work on time or do they show up to class on time? Are they in proper uniform? Do they interact well with their students? Are they responsive to corrective um, instruction? When you tell them that, okay, no, you didn't do that quite right, are they receptive to that? So those are the things we have to evaluate our students on. So you get buy-in from your employees by saying, hey, I created this form. What do you think about it? Do you think, do you, you know, does it flow for you? Do you like it? Do you think there's anything we need to add or change? Have them get their input, solicit input from them, so that way they can take ownership in this document. And if they take ownership in the document, they're more likely to hold their students accountable for it. So you get by in, whether it's, I created this sheet, oh, I created this counseling form, what do you think? Or, hey, we need to create this form. Let me know what items you want to have included on it. And you engage them. And by going to them, and ultimately, yes, the decision is yours, and you're going to make the decision, but you get their feedback, you get their input, so that they'll take ownership. And some of them may say, oh, well, I'll create it, because some are comfortable with the computer and they enjoy it, and some will just appreciate the fact that you took the time to ask. Also, 
even if you are promoted from within, ask them, what are your top two things that you think are a priority that we need to focus on to make this program better? What are the top two things that you think will help to make your job better? So you ask them those questions and I say top two. Why didn't I say three to five things? Because three to five things, you'll get everything but the kitchen sink. You want their priorities. So you can help focus on something and you can provide feedback on. This is what we're gonna do to address this issue. Or we look into the staffing. I know we need more staff, but right now, until we get enrollment up, they will not allow us to have additional staffing. So you can work on those things, give them feedback, and you're engaging them and you're letting them know that you appreciate them and you appreciate their input and you're taking them seriously. So to increase productivity, what do we need to do? Because we want everybody to do their part. And in EMS and in education, it's not always a nine to five, so to speak. You don't always come to work and get to go home at four o'clock, at 4.30 at five o'clock because you may have a student that needs extra help. You may have paperwork that you need to do and you need to have employees that are willing to do their fair share instead of I'm doing the bare minimum and I'm going home. So as a program director, you have to set clear expectations. You have to say, this is what I expect. And if they fall short, you have to hold them accountable because if you don't, you lose their respect. And once you lose their respect, you're not gonna get the things accomplished that you as a program director need to get accomplished. And by holding them accountable, it's not being rude, it's not threatening them, threat, threatening them with termination, it's holding them accountable. Of course, you do progressive discipline. You start with verbal counseling. After you talk to them verbally, then you do a written documentation to let them know what you expect. Most of the time, after you speak to them about it, it will not require you to, to advance it to the next level. But if it does necessitate, whatever the situation is, necessitate that you do, you have to be prepared to do it even with your friends. This is more applicable if you are promoted from within than if you come in from the outside, but you have to be ready to hold them accountable. And that's how you're gonna increase productivity and also get their buy-in. And again, the better your employees are, the better you are and the easier your job is as a program director. Because the more they do, the less you will have to do, unless you're it you're your entire staff but you still want to set clear expectations for your students even and hold them accountable so get your employees engaged ask for their input get their feedback and ask them their thoughts before you mandate even if you still are going to go with your decision you'll know their thought process and you'll be able to explain to them why this way is better so you have to, it's just really is helping you to prepare for any pushback that you may receive. And if you're coming in dealing with disgruntled people or burnout employees, expect pushback. And with change, any type change, expect pushback, especially if these are your friends and your buddies or they've been there for five, 10, 15 years. Expect pushback, but be prepared and to minimize the pushback engage them, get them involved in the decision-making process. So that's how we're gonna work that situation. So you have your employees involved, you have employee, they're giving you feedback, you've made your expectations clear. So now let's talk about poor record keeping. What do we do when we're looking for grades. We're looking for assessments. And by assessments, I mean the actual test that they took. What do they look like? Or do you only have a grade and no assessment? You have no clue what they were tested on. You don't know if the final was a 10 question test, a 25 question test, 150 question test. Are there any counseling forms? Were there any professional development opportunities made available to the staff? 
Did you have any advisory board meetings, let alone where are the minutes? Did you even have any meetings? Your medical director, is the medical director involved? If so, to what extent? Do you have any end of course reports? I know for the state of Georgia, the state requires records to be kept for, well, previously. The state would require at a minimum that the records would be kept for two years past their date of completion, which is the renewal cycle. So after the initial renewal cycle, then you didn't have to keep all of the documents from that class. However, now with accreditation and co-amps, you're required to keep your student records indefinitely. So what do you do when you take over this program and you have no records? You can't find the grades, you can't find any assessments, you can't find any documentation of the medical director's involvement. You don't know who's on your advisory board. And you just you are just at a loss because you have no records whether the records were intentionally deleted or destroyed or they didn't keep records at all who knows what the reason is but all you know is that you don't have the records and if you don't have the records you can't produce something that you do not have so what do you do in that situation how do you recover from poor record keeping? Well, the first thing you have to do is you may have to create forms. Do you have counseling forms? Do you have forms to evaluate their effect, effective domain? Do you have forms that document your progressive disciplinary actions before you dismiss the students? COAMPS requires that. They want to see that you initiated some form of pro, um, progressive discipline. Even with your employee, you have a progressive disciplinary policy. Do you put them on a performance improvement plan to improve? So you may have to create forms. You may have to write policy. One of the things I had to do was write a, even though there are laws in place, I had to write a policy on document management for the program because when I came in, records weren't being kept. Because I didn't have records, I had to show where I was trying to make a difference and trying to make a change. I also immediately scheduled advisory board meetings when I could find no records of an annual meetings. Really, for the even the two years prior to me beginning, I had no records of meeting. So what did I do? I scheduled a meeting. Who did I invite? Because I didn't know who was on the advisory board. I invited a ton of people. And whoever came, that's, that's where I began. And that's where I started to work with. And I had a lot of people that were willing and that wanted to assist, that wanted to be involved. I laid out my plan for the program. And so you have to schedule meetings and you have to make changes. If you see things that are not in place, you put them in place. And some things may be as simple as printing out a copy or having a student bring you a copy of their acceptance letter to the program. That is another form that COA requires. Did you, do you have a copy of their, oh, congratulations, you were accepted into the program. This is what's expected. This is when class starts. Does your program have a handbook? So you may have to begin to produce, create those documents if they don't exist. Again, how do you recover? You recover when you're dealing with the state, when you're dealing with um, any accrediting body, but in particular, co-amps is you be upfront and you are be honest. Let them know this is a situation that I inherited. This is where I am. I don't have these documents, but what they are looking for, 
even if you don't have the documents, they are looking for progress. They are looking to see that you are making progress, that you are taking steps in the right direction to rectify the problem. And more than anything, of course, having the documents would be nice. Absolutely, that's what they wanna see. They wanna see those documentations. They wanna see the, the, the test scores, they wanna see the assessments, they wanna see where your medical director approved the assessments that your students took. They wanna see that your medical director actually came into the class and talked to the students. They wanna see or your students went to the hospital or to their medical practice. They wanna see those things. So show progress, show that although we didn't have an advisory board meeting for the last two years, guess what? We've had two already this year. So show where you made progress. One of the things I did, I said, uh-oh, we haven't had, they haven't had one in two years, of course, prior to my arrival, but guess what? We're going to have one every quarter. And that's what I did. So show that you're dedicated, you're committed, and you want to make the program better. And that's what, that's all that they're looking for and all that they expect. And yes, the site visit is scary. <laughs> and after you go through it, you realize, okay, there's no need to stress. It's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. However, you have to be prepared. And the way you get prepared is to be honest and upfront, but also show progress. And guys, remember, if you have any questions, please submit your questions and I'll be happy to stop along the way and answer any questions that you have, okay? So please definitely feel free to ask any questions. So now what we're gonna talk about is student tracking. Why do we track our students? And how do we track our students? The why. Why do we track our students? One, it's the law. Your state, most states require in order for your program graduates to be licensed is that they, it's required that they meet a certain minimum standard. Now, fortunately, most states, National Registry and COAMPs are working together. They work together to mirror each other's requirements. And that makes it good for us as program directors, because if we're tracking for one, we're tracking for all. And if you're using a software, which we're gonna get into a little bit later, the different type softwares, if you're tracking them, it's gonna make it easier for you. But why do we track program integrity? And why are states, the National Registry and co on getting all on the same page is so that when individuals graduate from our programs, they will be able to provide the certain standard of care, a standard of care that all of our citizens, all of our communities can enjoy. And we can be, we can have confidence that they're receiving proper care. So that's why we track. And when someone graduates your program, one of the first things that happens if there's an incident in the field is, Look at their training record. How are they trained? Whether it's a firefighter, whether it's a paramedic or an EMT. They gave what? How much of that medication did they give? How were they trained? What was their training? When was the last time they had continuing education? So it does go back to program integrity and you want your program to be above reproach. You want your graduates to be above reproach. You don't want the state to come back and want to audit you. You don't want co-amps to um, pull your accreditation or put you on probation. So all of those things, you want to make sure that you're keeping track of your students and, and that everything is definitely above board. How do you do it? In the classroom or in the lab, we use software. Whether you're using Platinum Planner, whether you're using FizzDAP or any other software, and I am not getting paid by any company to promote their product. Those are just two of the most popular softwares that for student tracking that I'm aware of and that I've used. And it's important to set it up properly in the beginning. And I know that 
Platinum Planner, they'll do a webinar with you, or I say a webinar a training session, where you guys are doing real-time live training. And you can also set up one to where they will go over it with your instructors. You get all in the same room. You, they'll go over the software, how to set it up. If you run into any problems, they'll help you. And you can also, and you, I recommend you do it with your students at the very beginning of class so that there are no issues and they can get in there and play with it, understand how it works and how to track. You can also use the old fashioned paper and pencil way. However, at the end of your program, you will have to go back and add it in because you're gonna have to create these reports to track numbers. So make it easier for yourself on the front end and use a software that's already established. Or the reality is you can use an Excel spreadsheet if you set it up properly. So there are a number of different factors you can use to track your students' progress in the classroom and in the lab. And one of the things is um, Appendix G, you have to do certain things. You have to do this skill before you can do this skill with the scenario. And it's a progression. So understand all of your appendixes, how to track things, what's required, set it up properly on the front end, again, to make it easier for you on the back end. In the field, you have to make sure you track your patient contacts. How many patients did they come in contact with? What are their ages? What were their sex or gender? And what were their chief complaint? What were their skills? How did they, what skills did they provide? So you have a minimum number of requirements on those areas. So use your software or paper and pencil to track it, but you need to have a systematic way of tracking it and a way to where it could be verified. Also, are you tracking your preceptor evaluations? Are you taking the time to read them? And are you following up with your students? Because if you, if the preceptor provides feedback that this student was disrespectful to someone or mistreated the patient, then that's something you need to know and that you definitely need to address. So take the time to review the evaluations, but also have your instructors review it. And I understand a lot of times and in so many programs, it's only one of us and we have 20 students and we can't be in the classroom and do the administrative work and go to the clinical sites to evaluate. It's a lot. It's a lot for us to do. So one of the things that helped me that I did was I had an instructor that worked for the same organization that was on a nine to five, a 40 hour work week schedule. And what I had him do was for overtime, he went to the sites after he got off work and he would catch the, the students that were getting off at 7 P or yeah, that was ending at 7 P as well as the ones that were coming on at 7 P. So he went a little bit before seven and stayed a little bit after so that he could see both groups of students. He also interacted with the personnel at the clinical sites, whether it was the hospitals with the nurses or the EMS supervisors when we were doing our clinical rides. I also stayed in touch with phone calls and emails with my EMS services that were a little bit further away that I knew I couldn't possibly make it to everything. So there are different ways you can do it, but definitely track. And if you establish the relationship with your preceptors, then they'll let you know if somebody messes up. But take the time to review your evaluations and and keep track of your students because that's going to speak to the integrity of your program and by building these relationships it's also going to prevent you from having one student destroy your clinical contract because that can happen when you have a student that is determined to do things their way they want to show up when they want to leave when they want to go on unscheduled times things like that can definitely damage the relationship with your um, clinical partners. So when you have that relationship, it'll be that students that barred from that clinical site and not your entire program. So establish those relationships and that's also going to help you track at least your evaluations, if not the skills and your patient contacts. 
So now that what we're going to do is put it all together. We're going to get organized, get organized, because that's going to help us in the long run. We're going to find out what we have, what we need, what we have as far as staffing and equipment, and what we need as far as our paperwork, additional resources. Do you have to establish clinical contracts? Do you have any? What do you do? What what's needed for you to effectively run your program and that's when i say get organized identify your needs identify what you have identify what you need prioritize prioritizing also is going to help you manage stress so prioritize then understand your staff transform your staff and by transforming your staff you're also transforming the culture of your program and when you inherit a mess you need to transform the culture of your program. So you transform your staff, you transform the culture of your program, and you also transform the reputation of your program. And sometimes you'll have to engage in rebranding, which of course rebranding will be a, a topic for another day, but you have to sometimes rebrand your program, depending on how big of a mess you inherited. But recovering from poor record keeping, the way you recover is you create what you need, you don't falsify, you are honest in your reporting with co-amps and the states, what you have, what you don't have, most importantly, you communicate and you demonstrate what you're doing to make it right. What are you doing to make a change? What are you doing to, to track student progress? What are you doing to maintain these records? And sometimes you may get cited for something that you have no control over. And when I say cited, once COAMPS comes out for their site visit and they do their evaluation of your program, they may issue you a citation. Well, if you have no records of the pre previous cohort's grades or performance and a cohort has not graduated under your watch, then you cannot produce documentation that you don't have. So you may have a citation, but you show them where you're tracking their grades, where you are giving them report cards, and where you've created a final transcript. This is not as for technical schools, if you're working with a technical college system, of course, you have to submit grades every quarter. But if you're working for a private ambulance service or a fire department, then you have no quarterly grade reporting system. So you may have to use a software, whether it's Excel or free grade book software to track your progress or again, Platinum Planner. So they all, or EMS testing, they all have features that you can use, whatever textbook you're using. Many of them have online grade books that you can use now. So identify what you have, identify your funding and your availability to use a purchase additional software, but use what you have, make it easy for you. And then track your student progress. Utilize your software to the best of your ability, but to its maximum capacity. And if you utilize the software to its maximum capacity, take that few hours to learn it. It'll make it easier for you when it's time to pull reports, track progress, and move forward. Also guys, don't be afraid to ask for help. If you need help, reach out to someone that you know, a program director at another school. Reach out to whomever you know that may be able to help you. Build your network and it's okay to ask for help because we can't do everything by ourselves. So it's okay to ask for help and don't be afraid to ask for help. And most importantly, take care of yourself because we take on a lot as EMS professionals, as program directors. So you have to remember to take care of yourself because you function better when you are rested, when you can think clearly, and when you're not torn in many different places. Because we don't want to be like the little jellyfish on the screen. And that's actually a picture I took at the beach. And we don't want to get washed up to shore and can't get back in the water. So take time to take care of ourselves, whether it's meditation or um, 
mindfulness, whatever works for you. And you see my beach in the background. So whatever brings you peace and allows you to focus and regroup, it's okay to take time for yourself, whether it's a day off or whether you just shut off completely for the weekend. Take a weekend to regroup and get yourself together, but you have to take care of yourself. And that's definitely the most important out of everything. So are there any questions? Absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for that presentation. It's super informative, but we do have some great questions I want to make sure that we get to. Um, our first one comes from someone who says their university does not allow faculty to oversee other faculty and the program director is faculty in this program. So how would you suggest making change when they're not allowed to technically oversee other faculty? That is an excellent question. And the way you go about doing it is as program director, even though you can't oversee other faculty, what you can still do is let them know your expectations for the program. And you establish counseling forms. You create a form. And you start off with an initial counseling as far as what do you need? What can I do to help you? How can I make your job better? But you have to make your expectations clear. And I, I've been in the situation before where I was responsible for the program, but I wasn't responsible for the personnel. And what I did was make my expectation clear and you also document. Let them know what the program needs and you document. Because although you may not be able to hold them accountable or do a disciplinary action, you can escalate it. You can take it to the next level, which is whomever your supervisor is whether it's the dean, you take it to them, and this is my documentation. These are, these are the corrective actions that I tried to take. This is how I tried to rectify the situation. So have your documentation in order. And in that situation, of course, they're not gonna wanna sign it, So, but you still document and you do your verbal counseling and you talk to them. And that's where getting buy-in is going to be important. Involve them in the process. And I understand you might meet resistance, but you still try to involve them in the, in the process. And then you also document. So documentation is going to be your saving grace to show where you try to make a difference when you have to escalate it and get a dean or whatever the next level up or the first line supervisor that can oversee the faculty. When you get to that level, they will be able to address it. But in order for them to address it, you have to have your documentation in order. So keep your notebook and you document. And that would be my advice as to how to handle that. Awesome, thank you. And uh, next question. Do you know of any websites or resources for generic forms and or policies that have been vetted? So this came from when you were mentioning um, that you cannot produce records that were not already kept or provided to you, but you may have to start producing your own forms or documentation moving forward once you take over the program. Um, but do you have any recommendations as far as websites or resources for generic versions of that? Yes. So, well, I don't have recommendations for websites. What I did was I created my own forms and for forms that I wasn't sure how to create, I just Googled basic forms, say admissions acceptance letter. And I searched things like that. And I say Google, but search it and I did a search and I put pieces of forms together. I got an idea and I created a form. And I've also shared my forms and I don't mind sharing my resources. And I have shared them with many people and basically whoever's asked, I've shared forms. So I've created it because I've been in that situation. And I feel like the better you are, the better I am, the better we are. And I am very big on helping each other and doing what I can to help someone. So, so ask colleagues, ask me, but the, so I don't have a particular website, but you can search the forms online or ask someone, hey, what counseling form do you have? And I've shared pretty much all the forms I've created. I've shared them with someone. So I, some I shared all of them with someone, some I just shared what they asked for, but 
networking and building that network and asking for forms and getting them from people in that way. Wonderful, thank you. And we also just had somebody send in the chat. Um, I'm sending it again so that it's a view uh, available to view for all panelists and attendees. But there's a Google group where um, they're saying that there are many big names in the, in the paramedic faculty and um, big names in EMS education that are a part of this group where you can reach out to them and ask for resources or maybe questions like this might be good to, to pose in that, that group. Um, but we do still have more questions to keep moving through. Um, okay. The, so this next one is, it can be a bit daunting, they're saying to fill out the self-study. Is there resources that can help with that? And um, this individual says they call program directors and but they just hate bugging them. They were looking at maybe FISDAP, but do you have any other programs that you recommend? The program that I would recommend is Platinum Planner. And I am comfortable with Platinum Planner. For me, the staff at Platinum Planner has been quite helpful. Whenever I've had a question and I call in and I ask a question, they've been very helpful. When I couldn't pull up a report that I knew that once upon a time I could, I call them. So, and um, the, I think it's a Google group, but it's the email group and I can't see it, but that someone mentioned, you can send questions to that group. Hey, does anybody have this? Does anybody have that? But I personally enjoy using Platinum Planner and they mirror their setup to co-amps. So when you need a certain report, you can pull it from there. And yes, completing the self-study form is can be quite daunting. So take it piece by piece and break it into sections and do work on small tasks. I know you have to get it done, but work on small tasks at a time to put it all together, to put everything you need together and space it out so you're not crunched and you're doing it all within two days or two weeks to get everything done. Spread it out, do it little by little, but utilize the software that's available. And my favorite is Platinum Planner. And that's just my personal favorite. Awesome, thank you. And um, so moving to the next one, how much you convince your boss that running a training program with one full-time staff member who's shared with the ambulance service is impractical? Okay, I'm gonna give you two answers to my best advice on handling that. And one of the things is you have to use your one student to instructor ratio and use, use that to show we need this amount of instructors. But you also point out that I can't run calls and teach and I can't complete this paperwork. So you may have to break it down, do a presentation, do a PowerPoint presentation as to what is required of a program director. And a lot of people just don't know. They are absolutely clueless as to what it takes to run a program. And that's also one of the benefits when I printed out the response from the recommendations from co-amps and I posted it on the wall behind my desk is whenever my supervisor came in, he could see on the board everything I had to do because it was so much red on there. These are the things I'm working on. This is what I have to do. And I can't do this and be here. And I can't do this and be there. And you have to make it clear, especially when they're giving you other tasks. Well, I can't do that and do this too. And this has to be done and I have a deadline to meet this. And the other thing is I actually use my site visit. And I was open about the challenges my program faced with when co-amps came from my site visit. This is what it is. And they can't require you to have so many staff, but they can recommend. And after my site visit, I actually got an administrative assistant. And our, um, there was a staff, but I did get an administrative assistant because uh, co-amps noted it in their um, findings from the site visit is that there was not adequate staff. They can't mandate that you hire anybody because they're not going to fund it, but they can highlight the need for additional staff. So I use my site visit to get me additional staff. So that's, and that 
is an effective way, but depending on when your next site visit is, I would say put together a presentation for your supervisor to explain to them everything that's required as a program director and pull it straight from COAMPS. Pull the program director requirements from COAMPS and then list all the other stuff they have you doing. And But focus on COAMPS and accreditation and stress how important it is and then use that to help to convince them to get additional staffing because it is nearly impossible. It's very difficult to do all on your own. Wonderful. And then, um, so this next one, it's diving a little bit back into the Platinum Planner and everything, but is Platinum Planner set up for paramedic programs like FISDAP, or are you talking about using it um, specifically as a tool for self-study or for student tracking individually? Platinum Planner is set up for it all, for tracking the labs, and Platinum Planner also has the EMS testing component where you can use to test. You can use it to assess your students. It also has the analyze feature where you can analyze the, the, their test and the questions, which is also a requirement of COAMPS. So it is, and I'm more familiar with Platinum Planner than I am, FIS, than I am FISDAP. So I'm not saying that Platinum is better. That's the one that I am most comfortable with. And you use that and it does it from beginning to end, from when you're in the lab, when they go to clinicals. And it also has a feature where they can sign off, the preceptor can sign off on their, on their paperwork at the end of the shift. And once the preceptor signs it, they can't go back in and change it. So it requires them to complete their paperwork before they leave their shift. Now, I didn't require signatures until they were doing their capstone project. And then they had to have their preceptor signature before. And once you set it up that way in Platinum, once the preceptor signs it for their capstone, they can't go back and change it. So it's also a confirmation that they did do the minimum requirements. So Platinum, you can use it throughout. Fantastic. And I will say, if anyone has any further questions and wants to get specifically in touch with the rep from Platinum or from FISDAP, um, we at NEMSI have connections within both of those organizations. And if you reach out to me at nate.reese at nemsi.org, I'd be happy to put you in touch with a representative from both either or both of those um, Platinum or FISDAP. So if you want to reach out and look for more resources or something, I'd be happy to connect you with those people. Um, but I think so far we've addressed every question that has come in. Um, if you if you were willing to give out your email, we have had several requests for people to if they could reach out to you and maybe talk to you about certain things um, individually. Yes, I am trying to share it. I think I'm going to have to try to restart it again. I am so sorry, but I was trying to. I can include it in the follow up email as well, so it will be sent directly to everyone that's in attendance right now. Um, in both places. There we go. Can you see it? Let's see. It should be up now. No? I'm not seeing it come through in the chat. No, I shared it on the shared screen. I'm sharing my screen. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry, it was up. I'm sorry, I was looking at the chat box, but yeah. It is up, you can see it, correct? That is perfect, it is perfect. Okay, so that's my contact information and definitely feel free to reach out to me, contact, and I'll be happy to share any, any resources that I have. I'll be more than happy to share them with you without a doubt, so definitely feel free to reach out and ask me any questions that you still have following up, and I'm pretty good at responding to my emails as well as answering my phone. Even if I don't recognize the number, I'll definitely um, be answering my phone as well as responding to your email. So thank you all again for joining. And Nate, do we have any more questions? I think we have addressed everything so far. Um, I want to thank you so much for being here. And this has been a super informative presentation. Um, I know everyone definitely got a lot out of this and will continue to do so after we're posting it up on YouTube. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who was able to connect and for attending today. We really appreciate your support and for being here. So thank you to everyone. Thank you guys. Have a great day.